Hello and welcome to the 91st Milan San Remo, a race of 294 kilometers, the first classic and indeed the first World Cup of the season. I'm Phil Liggett as ever along with my co-commentator Paul Sherwin. We're looking down on the bunch of 200 riders here and although we're seeing a little bit of an effort by David Navas of the Spanish rider on Benesto, the field has spent the early part of the day, in fact much of the day, heading out down towards the San Remo coastline, chasing just one man. Michele Gobi, the Italian on the Mobile Vetter team, is the rider who set the pace and at one stage his lead was over 30 minutes, that's him on the right, but as always in Milan San Remo, the big field are more or less stay together, they keep the tempo high and as they come into the last 50 kilometers they all come together. And that is where we'll pick up the action now as we run down the coast of the Adriatic Sea heading down to San Remo. Well Phil, this is a normal Milan San Remo, you always have that early morning breakaway. I was a little bit astounded by that advantage of almost 30 minutes, but you know that man, he lost more than 10 minutes on the sole ascent of the Turchino, and that really is to me always the starting point of Milan San Remo, coming after 145 kilometers, you climb from the valleys inland from Milano, and then over the top you pop out onto the Mediterranean coast for the first time, and that's when the race really starts to hot up, and that's why we see an awful lot of pressure coming on, and the most important part then is the final 50 kilometers with all of those climbs coming every 10 kilometers or so and finally with the big Poggio at the end that's when the, the big men try and make their move. Well stunning scenery as ever this is uh, Andrea Taffy on second wheel there the rider from um, the mobile Veta team has just joined them there is the Filippo Baldato or Baldo rather from mobile Veta with the field scrabbling across here the pace is high and the riders, Lance Armstrong among the starters earlier today as well. He enjoyed a special reception here or there in Milan yesterday evening. And now the field trying to sort it out. They know if they're going to break the sprinters, the likes of Andre Schmil, last year's winner, and of course uh, Eric Zabel, who's won the race the two years previously, then the attacks must come. And it looks as though we have a little group here going away. Well, on the front here is Karsten Kroon. Second place there is Bart Voskamp, and then right up there as well, Jesper Skibby, the man just coming up now. Skibby riding an unbelievable start to the season here, Phil, because I was a little bit surprised to see him uh, actually racing this year. He had said that he wasn't going to race anymore, but I think his legs still feel pretty good. And the fourth man in that group, in fact, is the South African rider, Robbie Hunter. Well, it's nice to see Robbie firing. I had a stage win in his own tour, the Vodacom Report Tour in South Africa earlier. The season's beginning so early now, getting underway with races in Melbourne, Australia, with their International Summer of Cycling Week. Then we go over to uh, South Australia, down to Adelaide for the Tour Down Under. And that's where Eric Zabel and people like Stefan Wesserman, his teammate on Telecom, they have been piling in the kilometres this year. Zabel saying he's come to this race with 20,000 thousand kilometers in his legs already. Well, that's a lot Phil, I tell you one thing as well, it's rather strange because he's actually looking at performing well at the Sydney Olympics later in the season so certainly he's going to have to take a break sometime after the classic season because 20,000 kilometers is an awful lot. I remember when I raced the big men would think about having three or four thousand kilometers in their legs before they came to races like Paris Nice and now it's an awful lot more. There's the world champion there wearing 133 Oscar Freire and a man that is certainly not living up to the curse of the world championships jersey this year because he has ridden so well since the very start of the season and he's actually now on the starting line here at Milan San Remo as a favorite which is a big turnaround for a man we were surprised to see win the world championships at the end of last year. Well Mappe have spared no cost in trying to get him onto that winner's podium because they flew him down the course in a helicopter to check it out and he's gone back up to the start in Milan so they're treating him like the world champion we hope he will be this year. 
Everybody saying at the time, who was he? What a lucky win, as they might be expected to say, because nobody had heard of him. Uh, but he has developed into a very good bike rider. It's also good to see in the Mape squad there as well, Michele Bartoli, the man who was very aggressive last year in Milan San Remo, who, but who's been out of the sport for six months with that very bad knee injury which he got down in the Tour of Germany last season. But it'll be interesting to see how well he does perform because on the start line this morning, Philly had a huge bandage on his knee, maybe just a precautionary measure, but I wonder if he's already ready to start taking part in 300 kilometer bike races. Well, it is the longest classic, of course, and it is the first one of the year, but because of the nature of the road, the field generally stays together. But I think gone are the days when this race was used as a training race, UCI points at stake, World Cup points at stake, although this particular year, with Olympics coming up, it is going to be a tough one for them all. It certainly is. A lot of riders are looking to win this and make it part of the season-long campaign to try and win the overall uh, World Cup. And we can see this morning, in fact, wearing number one as last year's winner and the winner of last year's World Cup. Andre Schmiel is wearing the UCI World Cup leaders jersey in the starting gate. A little bit of action here. We've got Filippo Baldo joined by his teammate Sergei Lelikin. There they come together. They try to sort this out with the Mobile Veta boys. Easier said than done right now, and the rider number 35 there is David Navas, who's been in the action also today. But they're dangling just off the head here, and although Mobile Vetter are working very hard, they came over to the um, tour of Langkawi and rode there. Um, and they've got on their team, of course, Evgeny Berzin, but he have to say he's not the rider he was and didn't really figure at all in the tour of Langkawi. Phil, the race like Milan San Remo is absolutely crazy, you know. It's 294 kilometres long, but in this last 50 kilometres, with all the capos, as they call the hills here along the coast, coming in a repetitive nature, there's a lot of riders take risks to stay very close to the front. And I've seen Milan San Remo's where a man has almost used out a complete set of brake, block, brake blocks yeah. because you're coming to the front, braking, accelerating, braking all of the time. It's a very nervous race, especially as it is the first race of the season. But you can see a bit of organisation coming into the front of the pack there because because there is the big man himself, Wilfred Peters, a man who I uh, would certainly like to have as a domestic. There you can see Michele Bartoli as well. You can see the, the bandage on his knee there, pulling it all together alongside him, I think, is his teammate, Paolo Bettini. Well, he must be feeling pretty good to be at the front at this stage in Milan San Remo. This has been, uh, this he hopes will be a big comeback for him after that dreadful crash he had in the Tour of Germany last year and uh, suffering a similar injury indeed to that of Johan Muse the previous year and his teammate and who is riding this event by the way uh, Johan doing that in Paris-Roubaix of 98 the field are very much all together greatly reduced of course as the levels of fitness comes into play but the big teams have got themselves to the head of this race I caught a glimpse and you may have done too of the white jersey there of Andre Schmilt the first leader of the World Cup by virtue of his victory last year up near the front as one would expect we now keep swinging away from the coastline over these little ripples of hills just enough to hurt the legs the Poggio for example the last springboard before the finish is only 162 uh, feet high meters high rather uh, but it's the in 3.75 kilometers it really does shoot up a little bit and let's not forget that that's after 290 kilometers of bike racing I've always found that the Cipressa is a much harder climber that was put into Milan San Remo in the last few years basically to try and split the, the race up to prevent it becoming a race for the sprinters but even so nowadays the sprinters seem to have changed in the old days sprinters certainly couldn't go up the hills as well as they do nowadays and men like Eric Zabel certainly are able to go over even some of the smaller mountain stages and still survive to stay in a group of 40 or 50 riders towards the end and that's what Zabel will be hoping for today Phil is to try and stay in a group of 25 or 30 riders which goes over the summit there of the Cipressa and then plunges down to the coastline races along the coast and then he'll hope to hang on in a climb like the Poggio towards the end. Well slowly but surely here that field is winding in the escapees as they're just keeping them under control before the final climbs that come their way. Martin Denbacher down there champion of Holland as the pace is kept up nicely by Mappe. Mappe doing a very good job here just to keep this race under control it's Peters on the front still the Rabobank boys are moving forward all the boys are sensing again that they must be where they need to be as we swing over these climbs just in case this race splits but it has been the domain of the sprinter these past few years and sprinter singular I think is the word Eric Zabel having two wins out of the last three years 
Absolutely, but the thing about Milan San Remo, Phil, is it's always a very dangerous race as well because not only have you got this repetitive nature of all the capos, Capo Berta, Capo Melli, then the Cipressa, but also it's a race which is very much uh, marked by crashes as well. And in the last few years, we've seen on very often occasions the race has actually been split because of a crash going through one of the very narrow times. And because of the speed and that crash going down, that's when we very often find a group of 30 or 40 or 50 riders splitting off the front of the main field. Well, here come the first two back into the fold as the tempo is picked up by the big field behind. And this is David Navas of Bernesto sitting on the wheel there. I think of uh, Filippo Baldo of Mobile Vetter. There's the uh, breakaway right at the front. They're down to three now, Paul. So, oh, no, there's four of them there. So they are still clear. That is Kroon, Voskamp, Skibby and Hunter who are trying to throw down the gauntlet. And we're around about 35 kilometres from the finish here. Well, those four riders at the front field, they've got an advantage of two minutes and 40 seconds over the main field. So that is actually starting to look a little bit serious, although we are getting reports that Robbie Hunter is not actually contributing to the success of that breakaway at the front. And that's a bit strange because Robbie is a very good sprinter and he's the kind of guy that if this group does stay away is certainly able to put a big distance between himself and the rest of the group. This is now Jesper Skibby from the new Jack and Jones team right down there in a very low tuck position trying to keep the pace high and there is Hunter at the back the Lamprey rider but obviously the reason that Robbie is not riding is the fact he must have had orders from the team Phil not to ride at the front because certainly he's a young professional and I think he would like to be riding at the front and trying to make sure that this breakaway can succeed. Well as Skibby shows, shows us there his technique we're heading towards the suppressor as we're now looking at this breakaway, Hunter, you may remember, came to the fore in Milan San Remo last year as a young professional and I know delighted many of his fans in South Africa. At last they had a man to shout for in the big peloton and after a great year in which he won a stage of the Tour of Spain, he's now settling in big time. We expect to see him progress this year. He's on a good team with Lamprey, enjoys the company of that team and they've got some big names like Franco Ballerini and uh, Jan Zarada on that squad still very happy to sit at the back here although I would expect to see him a little frustrated because he is a good bike rider he is a courageous bike rider but sometimes team tactics do take uh, the lead you have to do what the team management says and that's why we've got him on the back here he's obviously thinking about his teammate Oscar Kamenzind or even Franco Ballerini and possibly mm. if it does all stay together Jans Verada having a crack at the victory towards the end so his role today is very much the role of a domestique and he has to ride to orders Nico Matan, the man that once had a heart problem and lost his job as a cyclist and he's got it back now and looks to be on the attack here trying to incite a move from behind, well here it comes Bart Voskamp up there, well he's a specialist of the longer skate, the Dutchman he's had a couple of stage wins in the Giro d'Italia, he's had a stage win in the Vuelta and uh, here he is now up amongst the leaders Skibby having a word with him, he's on new colours now Voskamp, he said goodbye to TVM and Carsten Kroon Rider we don't know too much about, he's never had a win as far as we know, but he's coming through in the Rabobank colours. Well, Kroon's in his second year as a professional. Funnily enough that uh, Skibby and Voskamp rode on the same team for an awful long time, so they'll know each other very well. And I just saw a little whisper between the two of them there, yeah. and I'd like to hear exactly what they were <laughs> saying. Probably slow down, I'm not as young as you, but still, we'll see. Massive crowds as always, and as you can see, this is a... It brings the riders really to the top of their form because it's nice to be racing in warmish sunshine again. Heading down to San Remo, we hit the uh, coastline on the Tyrolean Sea and then we run right down this beautiful coastline all the way down to San Remo. It's an absolutely crazy race and it's one the riders all get very excited about. It's the first real major rendezvous of the year. OK, we've had Het Volk already, which is the first major race in the northern part of Europe. But this is the first race when the whole of the peloton really gets together. Some of them have been to Paris, some have been to Terreno Adriatico. But when you come to the start of Milan San Remo, it's the first rendezvous for all of the big names of cycling to come to. The first time many of them may have had a chance to see some of their, their colleagues since the end of last season. Men like Lance Armstrong, it'd be interesting to see see how Lance performs here because last year he actually rode a very good Milan San Remo he was very much to the front and this is a race that in the past he'd always thought that he had a chance of winning and one certainly he would like to put down on his pedigree but unless the big boys can break up the sprinters they are going to be taking them all the way down to San Remo here the first big race results are known of course Johan Musea winning the Volt Classic to start the season great to welcome him back to the big time 
Andreas Clurden from Germany. He was the new star of Paris Nice. A little bit of switching and bumping going on there with Salvatore Camesso involved. And the race just down the road here because it crosses in this region, the Terreno Adriatico. Uh, that has been won by Abraham Olano. So some familiar names and some new names. And I think that will possibly be a good indicator for the season because I think this year we'll see some good new names come through. Absolutely, it's nice to see the name of Andreas Cloden, a very young, fresh name. But let's just have a look at that little incident again, Phil. This is what Milan San Remo is all about. There's a little quack there, as they call it in Flemish. The man there at the back there from the liquid gas team, he did a great maneuver just to keep himself upright. But everybody is nervous. Everybody's trying to be as close to the front as possible. But because it's such a long race, they don't want to ride right in the first two rows. They want to be just a little bit further back, and they'll take risks to stay there. I say it as well, though, we had picture only with no sound because I'm sure there were a few languages spoken down there. The field is still concerned about this breakaway. It's still up the road by some distance. And you've got some good work horses in it there. Hunter is a little confused, sitting at the back under orders and waiting to find out which way this breakaway is going. Here we are, back and Robbie still sitting at the back, the South African, Voskamp. Is the Palti colours with the yellow shorts there. Skibby comes back to number three, and it's the turn of Karsten Kroon on the front. Well, I'm sure there's been a few words of Flemish or Dutch, Dutch exchange there with Robbie Hunter, because although Robbie Hunter is from South Africa, he speaks Afrikaans, and he will be able to communicate with those two guys on the front, and they'll know that, and they'll use the best of their fluent Flemish to tell him what they think about him sitting on this breakaway. And if they've any doubt, of course, then I'm sure Jesper Skibby will interpret for him, because Jesper speaks the best of English. But he's doing his job and it's under orders, he's a pro and there's not much they can do about that. These two poor riders are still uh, stuck in midstream here and it's Felipe Baldo and David Navas, the Spaniard on the front, on these little climbs as we're bound towards the Cipressa and it looks to me as though they're going nowhere right now caught right in the middle of this uh, action at the moment the four leaders have still got a lead of two minutes but I'm certain Phil when we get a little closer to the Cipressa that will start to crumble because we'll see in the main field a lot of the big teams coming to the front that's when the Mape squad will certainly move forward to try and control the peloton they probably feel that they've got the, the matching of this leading group of four at the moment and they'll pull it back and but once they do start the big guns rolling they'll pull back half of that advantage in the first 10 kilometers or so but Jesper Skibby well it's great to see him he's just swung off the front now in the red and white jersey of the memory card Jack and Jones team he's a great bike rider he's put in some sterling performances over a very long career and I think now he's just maybe riding out the last year or two of this uh, of his very long seasons and certainly I think he's enjoying his cycling now well this time last year he was telling us that last year was his last season but it was such a good one uh, starting off with second place overall in the tour down under he's extended it but this is definitely his last year and we could well see him on the, the sort of management side of the memory card which is a new sponsor for the home team home Jack and Jones uh, team after this a little bit of an admonishment there from Carsten Kroon to Robbie Hunter absolutely had no effect whatsoever and so they may as well just get on with the job. You have to have a hard skin as a bike rider, especially when you're riding to team orders like that. Because Robbie Hunter, I know Robbie very well, as you do, Phil. He's the kind of rider who would love to be working in a situation like this. But when you've got men like Franco Ballerini, Cameron Zint, and of course Jans Verada in the team, you have to think about the team fa factor. You have to think about it's more important for the team to win the bike race than it is for you to finish third or fourth. And certainly Jans Verada is the kind of man who in the past has always put in very good performances here at Mid Milan San Remo so Robbie is still sitting in the back position there and he'll be hoping that this break stays away because if it does the advantage is certainly going to come across to him Skibby now taking up first position Skibby is a, a great man in fact if, if it wasn't for the fact that he'd uh, been on the TVM team for an awful number of years I think he may well have won a, an awful lot more races because he's been very often forced to play the, the supporting role for a lot of the Dutch riders but he seems to have been happy riding for TVM and Dutch teams for many years but he's now decided towards the end of his career he feels a lot happier returning to a Danish team returning to a Danish ambiance and interesting as well to note during the, the winter transfers that in fact Bo Hamburger as well has decided to switch across to this new Jack and Jones team he's in the, the field this morning but I think Bo Hamburger's uh, goals and aims Phil are an awful lot further down the road no reference to the fact he's cooked either well, that's Jesper Skibby, who celebrates his 36th birthday in just three days' time. And he certainly uh, looks young enough to be far younger than that, does Jesper. And he's showing the legs of a 25-year-old right now. 
and enjoying his twilight years as a top professional cyclist. Over the years since he turned pro back in 1986, so he's starting here, his 15th season as a pro. He's had 24 wins and some of them very noted indeed. You see the main field starting to get a little bit more excited now and it looks as if there's been a, a slight acceleration because the field is stretching out now and the amazing thing about Milan San Remo is um, one or two of these long coves that you go around that uh, you can actually look across the water and see the back end of the main field if you're riding to the front of affairs especially when they start to pick it up and they are picking it up quite a lot now as we come now towards the Chipressa where we're certainly going to see some serious attacks coming Hunter sitting very high on the handlebars there just relaxing trying to keep his energy as uh, in check as possible because he realizes that the responsibility is going to lie on his shoulders if this brake does stay clear but in fact they've just lost another 30 seconds of their advantage and the last time check Phil was down to one minute and 30 seconds yeah so certainly that the main field has started to react because for the main field they're coming to the in, they're coming to the serious part of the course Chibresa and the, and the Poggio of course so that's where they're hoping to pounce and bring it all back together in we should be treated to some enormous attacks on those climbs once they get to them but that's the gamble now the big teams are coming towards San Remo at an average speed of 40 kilometers an hour 25 miles an hour and they're just doing enough to keep them under control and hope they can unleash riders at them as they start the last couple of climbs that's the theory at the moment though these three are rather annoyed by the fact that Robbie Hunter is just the ticket collector today and he's just keeping an eye on things and it looked uh, looking over his shoulder there Paul he might well have been looking back to see if he could see the race the amazing thing about Milan San Remo, Phil, is it's a race where, although it's 294 kilometers long, there seems to be people the whole length of the way. It's known as the Primavera, which is basically a translation meaning springtime. But look at the crowds there. It's not just for the last 40 or 50 kilometers in this bike no. race. It's all through the early towns, right from the very start in Milano. It's an incredible festival of cycling, and people turn out to watch this bike race in droves. It is a great bike race, and it's one that I always used to get very excited for. But in the old days, actually, they used to have unlimited numbers at the start, and you can see these two guys are about to get picked up by the main field. These two have been caught in between David Navas and uh, Filippo Baldo. But on the start line in the old uh, Milan San Remo's field, they used to have 320 starters, which is quite amazing because the crashes started before you even got out to the neutralized section. Nowadays, under the new regulations, the field is limited to just 200 starters. Um, but I think you need plenty of wheels to follow such a long distance at this time of the year. Gone are the old early spring classics, not spring classics, but training races down in the south of France. The Grand Prix Saint Raphael, the Grand Prix d'Antibes and uh, the Grand Prix de Cannes. Uh, they, that was really the start of the season in the old days, wasn't it, Paul? Absolutely. A lot of those races have disappeared. They were actually used very much early on as preparation races for later on in the season. And stories like Job Zotemel, the man who won the Tour de France in 1980, turning up in the month of February with just 500 kilometers of bicycle racing in his legs, although most of his winter had been spent doing cross-country skiing. Nowadays, it's unbelievable the amount of kilometers that riders have before they come to the first bike races. And as you said before, that it's reputed that Eric Zabel has already done 20,000 yeah. kilometers of training. Well, that's a amazing that's half Enormous. of what we used to do in a year absolutely right here are the two in between us about to go back into the field as uh, Baldo looks over his shoulder knows now that it's hardly worth keeping going but they'll keep going and see if somebody comes up to join this has been a very solid piece of riding by the Spanish rider from Benesto though Navas as we go back up to the leaders Robbie there having a little look at the camera looking pretty cool and just enjoying uh, life in the caboose. He started his season off very early, as you said, Phil, with the Vodacom Report Tour. And so many of these pros these days are starting their seasons much further afield in Europe. In the old days, you either started with the races in the south of France or with the races in uh, southern Spain. But now there are riders starting the season in the Tour Down Under, which is where Eric Zabel started his early season campaign, the Tour de Langkawi in Malaysia, or even racing in South Africa. The, the sport of cycling has become such an international sport. Many of the sponsors now, being large multinational companies, want their bike riders and their teams to take part in these races because there is the pressure of getting as much advertising as possible around the globe. Yes, absolutely. Well, they're the big legs of a sprinter, Robbie Hunter. He's now 22 years of age. Soon be celebrating 23 this April. Turned professional last season and looking good now for a good solid career. He'll never forget that stage in the Vuelta España when he shot fourth 
the opening stage last year, the Tour of Spain, and grabbed the victory. There had been a little a bit of confusion behind with a crash, uh, but he was already in the right place and victory was his. A little bit more luck because he only just lost the overall points competition to Frank Vandenbroek right on the final day. At least he didn't have the... Uh the, the jackpot prize of taking the, the Meta Volantes, the hotspot sprint competition, was pretty impressive in your first year as a professional bike rider. Looking down on the main field there, there are the two riders who were caught in no man's land. They're about to get picked up by the main field. But Michele Bartoli is looking very attentive. He was actually just lying in second position there on the wheel of one of his teammates, keeping to the front of the main field on one of these little capos before we drop down into the next town. And then we'll be looking at shooting up to Depressa. And that's when the big accelerations are certainly going to come. And I wonder if Michele Bartoli has got the strength that he had last year to launch an attack on that climb, which is around about 20, 25 kilometers to go to the finish. And here comes the catch. They've done well to hang out this long. In fact, the Spanish rider is determined to go down fighting here as he continues to ride on, trying to take the sunnies off as the field comes up and it's still the Mape boy setting tempo. Michele Bartoli, you know, Paul, is poised right there. He certainly is, but riding very close to the front as well as the world champions jersey of Oscar Freire, so that's interesting to see. He has turned out to be somewhat of a sprinter because that was a surprise win at the world championships at the end of last year when he rocketed out of that pack with a very late attack in the final kilometre. But this season he's proving to be very rapid in the big bunch sprints and it's a big, I think, a sensible move for him to switch across to the Mape squad. And In fact, Phil, this is probably the first time we've seen Robbie Hunter go to the front, so finally he's decided, I think, to put a little pressure into the work of this leading group of four. Feel there still playing a close attention. Bit of action here now. And it looks as though Robbie Hunter's moved off the back here. And he's starting to turn the screw a little bit. Maybe the tactics are about to change. Well, this is the scent off the Capo Berta, but behind you can see that the main field was starting to accelerate. They'll now drop into the town of Imperia and then almost immediately if they've gone through Imperia they will be on the slopes of the Cipressa and that's when we'll have to see just exactly what's going to happen in this this leading group at the front but certainly behind Mape is the team who are putting the pressure on they're starting to wind it up to keep their men in the front half of the main field because very often it's through this next town where there's usually a little accident or a little crash because you come into the town square and there's a fountain right in the middle of the road and it's always turned on for Milan San Remo and it makes the cobblestones just a little bit damp watch out for that as uh, obviously Robbie has now decided to go straight to the front and just pull this race down the slopes not giving away too much in the form of his strength but the rest because of this narrow road is going to follow him down here we're descending at just on 60 kilometers an hour about 38 miles an hour back to the main field here and again all that work done on the knee there of Michele Bartoli taking no chances whatsoever that was Stefano Zanini, the other Italian rider on the Mape squad at the front, setting the pace for uh, Michele Bartoli, given the title of 131, which makes him the leader of the team on the road. But when you look at the bike riders in the Mape squad, it's very difficult to pick who exactly will be the leader. Bartoli, Bettini, Oscar Ferreira, Museo and, uh, and Taffy as well. It's an unbelievable list of bike riders. Oh, it was a fabulous team, of course. They're still the world's number one. They're being challenged, but it's still the world's number one team, Mape. Looking for victories wherever they ride, of course. And on good days, they've got riders in three or four different races. It's not unknown to catch a stage winner or two around the world. Absolutely, that's the team politics to have as large a team as possible. So if they want to, they can actually race on three separate fronts. They have this year got a small development squad and most, most of those riders are based around Milano in the small town of Malpensa near the international airport. And one of the riders who is on that development squad is an Englishman by the name of Charlie Vigelis. And he was telling me one or two stories about the training rides that they do when the whole of the team gets together. And you've got 40 bike riders from one team and they go out and they have uh, pretend races. I tell you what, I wouldn't like to do a pretend race with the likes of uh, <laughs> Wilfred Peters and Johan Museo. I think I would agree with you there, Paul. Well, it's still out in front, that little breakaway. There's Andre Schmil, last year's winner, and also went on to win the World Cup after that start to the season he had last year. The field now heading towards the Cipressa at high speed. The gap is down with the four leaders, but they're still in with a shout. And it would it be a lovely decision, it would indeed, if Jesper Skibby could stay away to the finish. 
Absolutely. The thing is, for those guys, they do have the advantage of not being involved in the fights and the tussles as we come up to the bottom corner of the Cipressa. You can see a lot of riders moving and switching their arms and leaning on each other here in the front of this group here. And that's the way it will be right until that final corner before you go into the Cipressa. And it's actually a pretty dangerous corner as well, Phil, because you come sweeping round a left-hand bend, then all of a sudden you've got a 90-degree right-hand turn and immediately you're going uphill. And everybody fights to get into that corner in the first 10 places. There's Oscar Frere and they're actually giving him a fair amount of space there to ride fairly close to the front of the main field but there is big organization now coming from Mape uh, moving across there there's the fountain I was telling you about <laughs> that's the one it looks as though it's okay there today as they've split asunder come out back together again continue on their narrow streets we're heading up towards the Cipressa now Mape have got the drive at the front and they're thinking, I'm sure, of Oscar Freire and perhaps Michele Bartoli. And Bartoli might want to find out just how that leg is going to react after all these kilometres today. So he could well try an acceleration very shortly. We're back up with the leaders here. And back in the back seat is Robbie Hunter. Good work being done by Mappe. They're quite clearly, Paul. They have a plan now. Absolutely. That was Paolo Forniciari on the front there, the big lead out man. There is Zanidi next in the line. And then it's Michele Bartoli. So seriously, I think the plan today is for them to launch the attack on the climb of the Cipressa to try and see if they can get a small group of five or six bike riders away. And then obviously they have a double-headed advantage because they can keep Oscar Freire back and then Freire can save himself for the sprint if there is a group of 25 or 30 riders towards the end. But certainly you can see now that Mape have decided Cipressa is going to be the point where they will put in the attack. And it'll be interesting to see if Michele Bartoli, with six months out of competition, has got the chance and the power to launch the, the attack on that very difficult climb of Cipressa. Well, the last check we got was 50 seconds to these four. They were at one stage, 2 minutes 40. Not a lot of information coming at us, but 50 seconds is not very much. And the catch could be made just as they start the climb of the Cipressa if this rate uh, of progress keeps being attained. That wouldn't be very nice at all, having been at the front of the bike race working like this and getting caught by a flying main field, you just certainly do not have the acceleration or the jump to be able to keep the pace up and stay in the group. But these boys at the front, the four riders, Hunter, Voskamp, Skibby and Kroon, have certainly got an awful lot of publicity for their team sponsors. And another team moving forward now is the Lotto squad. They are trying to make sure that they've got an advantage and trying to keep their man, the man who won this bike race last year, Andre Schmiel, very much in the first five or ten places. Everybody looking around now, seeing who's going to come through and work. Cofferty's are working well here. Chris Piers doing a lot of work on the Cofferty squad as they're trying to set it up as well here. But they don't have a lot of the top riders. Uh, but Frank Vandenbroek has been totally invisible so far and Joe Plankar perhaps a better bet here. In fact, three Cofferty's riders moving up into the first three places so they obviously feel confident in the performances of Frank Vandenbroek although Vandenbroek this year has been somewhat enigmatic He's a very strange bike rider. I'll tell you, after the winter that he's passed, he's certainly had a very difficult time. That's Nico Matin on the front. Next man in line is Philippe Gaumont. And then it's Massimiliano Lelli. So they've got three strong riders at the front. I can't see Frank Vandenbroek anywhere, but he'll be wearing number 58, if you can catch a sign of him from the helicopter shot here. But they too have decided that Cipressa is going to be the important part of this bike race. And that's why they're trying to move forward and keep the pace high. Sergei Ivanov moving up there too in the Russian champion's jersey. And just ahead of number one there, Tiddy Marischal looks as though he's the guard and the lead out man for Andrei Schmil. And they're all rushing forward here. As soon as they see daylight here, they're scrabbling for the gaps. I just saw George Hincapi come through as well. Yeah, he's right there, 225, right on the wheel of Frankie Andreu. They're going to try and keep Big George at the front of this bike race because George, over the last couple of years, has proved that he is a very good, strong sprinter. And if he can stay in the leading group of 20 or 30 bike riders, he's got a chance of getting himself right up there into the overall victory here because Hincapi is a very good sprinter. You can see the four leaders now. It's starting to be a little bit of panic because they realize that their advantage is slump, slumped from 2 minutes and 40 seconds down to 50 seconds. And I'm sure the next time we do get a time check, Phil, it's going to be an awful lot less than that. This is Carsten Kroon just swinging off the front here. He's a very young professional. He's only in his second year. So this is his first attempt at Milan San Remo. He's never won a victory at all. But this is the, the development squad of Rabobank starting to bring in some of the younger riders. Because yeah. Rabobank, in fact, not only did they sponsor the big 
uh, international team that they have here we see the most of but they also have a women's team they also have a development team for youngsters as well as supporting cyclocross and mountain biking as well yeah no, it's a complete all-round setup and it was all developed uh, by Jan Ross the former world champion he spends most of his time handling the paperwork now and sends others out on the road like Theo De Roy talking to George Hincapi there Paul ninth in this race last year and that started a wonderful spring campaign for him with his fourth place as well in Paris Roubaix and knocking on the door in Ghent Wavelgum Big George might be feeling very confident now it's nice to see him getting in the right place anyway as we start the long approach road to the Chipressa Well it's amazing Phil that George is only uh, 26 years of age and it seems as if he's been a professional forever because he actually turned professional very young he was 20 years of age when he became a professional rider with the Motorola squad and certainly he's uh, becoming more and more experienced and he's still got another 10 years in front of him if he wants to Yeah absolutely I remember him actually being disqualified from a, a sprint in the Tour du Pont a few mm. years ago and I think it was a very unfair decision because it was a very dangerous finish one of those finishes where some riders actually put 55 tooth chain rings on because they plummeted down the hill into the town of the homestead and then it was a right hand bend and George knew just exactly how he had to win that bike race he came across the line in first place and he was disqualified and he was in tears afterwards when I interviewed him yeah I remember that it was a sad occasion for George certainly in fact, uh, strangely enough, the man who I think won the day on that occasion was a man by the name of David Rayner, who was uh, rather saddened to take the victory because David Rayner used to like winning bike races in a straight and normal fashion. And David Rayner, unfortunately, is no longer with us anymore. And uh, they've created a David Rayner Foundation in the United Kingdom to uh, remember Rayner as a bike rider. And many of the young British riders coming through now are actually helped to go overseas and ride for sponsored clubs in France and Italy and Spain and try and keep the level of uh, British cycling at, uh, to a high. And it's all in the name of Rayner, who was a, a great bike rider. And one of those men uh, benefiting, benefiting from that foundation is Jamie Burrow, who starts this year as a member of the US Postal Team. Another one is Charlie Wagalius, who now rides for the MAPE team. And another one is David Miller on the Cofferdis team. So that foundation has gone from strength to strength. Absolutely. We can see now that Telecom is starting to become a little bit more serious in their manoeuvres at the front here. A quick uh, glimpse there of 215 is Jan Schraff. But uh, obviously, number one team in the world has to be Mape. They know exactly what their orders are. They've been a little bit in the, in the back seat up until now, Phil. But now, as we do approach very rapidly into the town where we will turn right and head up to Cipressa, they are keeping the pressure very much on at the front because they know, too, riding at the back in Milan San Remo is very dangerous indeed. And for them, the big point is, first of all, the Capoberta, which is a very difficult climb at around about 65 kilometers to go. But then everybody knows the attacks will certainly come on the Cipressa and we will reduce this bunch from what is still around about 140 riders to probably only 30 or 40 by the summit. The telecom team also easing their way forward now to try and keep a grip of things with their man Eric Zabel. Looks like Ekimov has come up in the third wheel there and now this race is absolutely flying down here 50 kilometers an hour they're going to start the slopes of the Cipressa at a very high rate of knots indeed. The gap is now 45 seconds here as the slopes will soon begin and still at the back and not helping is Robbie Hunter. Well, they're holding on. I'm quite surprised because the speed in the main field is pretty dramatic and these guys are still holding on. But I tell you what, it's probably come below the 30 second mark now because yeah. they've moved out the neutral service vehicle. That white car just being sent by by the referees very rapidly means behind the gap is really starting to plummet quickly. Well, this is it. This is the climb and straight away. Robbie Hunter has got the nod to go and go he has. The other three are probably uttering a few oaths at that attack because he has done nothing in the breakaway. But now now he's free as a bird here. Robbie Hunter launches the attack and is giving it everything. And he said goodbye to the others as we've started the climb of the Chipressa and the lead is 4-0 seconds. Well, he's not going to make too many friends from those three and I'm sure they'll have a few words to say with him after the finish. But there's the attack there. He waited and he obviously knew that the group was coming back from behind and he has ridden to Wardersville but you can see he's a very concentrated young man now trying to keep the pressure on but he has to realise that the main field are certainly going to eat his end into his advantage very rapidly indeed on the early slopes of this climb. Sun is getting high in the sky or low in the sky right now because this is almost the end of 294 kilometers of riding today which is a long way in anybody's book and the longest probably Robbie Hunter ever races in any year as a pro 
There is the main field now and just around the bend are the three and just in front of him, of those rather, is this man here, Robbie Hunter. And he's gritting his teeth and he's hoping now. Well, you can see Rabobank taking up the chase at the front there. The Dutch national champion was on the front of the main field. But several riders now starting to splinter off. There are the three riders just going out of sight. The three riders who were part of the four-man leading group just a few moments ago. And Robbie Hunter is really hurting now. He's not the relaxed bike rider we saw just a few moments ago. He realizes now this is the time of the race when you've got to really go for it. And this is the time of the race when a group of 20 or 30 riders can move forward just by the natural evolution of the race. Well, what a long way this young man has come in just 12 months of being a pro bike rider. There now, the boys are being picked up by the advanced scouts here and this is Michele Bartoli, the man with the bandaged legs, so now this is a big test for him. This is unbelievable, I never would have expected to see him being so competitive so early on, but look at the advantage already, Phil. As soon as they hit the bottom of Cipressa, he's gone out and launched the attack. He attacked on Cipressa last year when he was at the height of his capabilities, but now he's managed to shoot off the front here and he's opened up an unbelievable gap. So we were right about the Mape tactics that was to try and keep it hard. And in fact, they're not able to follow the acceleration here of Michele Bartoli. And I reckon after six months out, Michele Bartoli is back. Well, let's hope so, because he's a wonderful single-day rider. Here's how he comes up and launches the move. A lot of power in those legs. He's got one win already this year, a small win on the island of Mallorca, which is a nice little training race for him, but enough to give him the morale. It must have been like winning a classic race when he announced his comeback there. So he has some form. But this is the rider who's trying to stay away and hide now. He's just come back from his home country of South Africa where he got his first win of the year. And it looks like Juan Carlos Dominguez is a Vitalicio rider. And there he is. So we've got Dominguez and Bartoli together. Well, that's a great move by Dominguez. He'll be very happy to be there with number 131. Just up the road now, you can see Robbie Hunter. Now, Robbie Hunter is in a bit of a predicament here, Phil. He's got to try and survive till we get into the town of Cipressa at the top here. And if he can, he will be in a very good situation, being with two very strong bike riders for the last 20 or so kilometers of this bike race. But I can tell you one thing, that attack by Michele Bartoli was really pretty impressive because everybody will have been waiting for the attack to come here on Cipressa and he's just absolutely ridden away from them all. Well, he's picked up a partner here in Dominguez who's really a stage race rider rather than a single day winner. He's already had second in the Tour of Valencia this year without winning a stage, third in the just finished Tirano Adriatico without winning a stage. And last year had a great season. He won three big stage races, Tour of Aragon, Tour of Rioja and the Tour of the Asturias. And in only two of those races did he win a stage. So he's consistent, but he isn't really a winner. Well, that's, a, that's the sign of the, I think, Spanish cycling at the moment. They are starting to become much more aggressive in the one-day races. In the past, we've, ve we've seen very much that the Spanish teams have concentrated on the multi-day stage races. But over the last couple of years, they have been a lot more present in the one-day races. And that's, I think, something we're going to see a lot more of in the future. But this is great to see for the Vitaligo Seguros team because it's a fairly new team and they're actually trying to, to improve as the years go by. And they seem to be doing that higher, slowly. They're getting up to the higher rankings in the international governing bodies uh, uh, World Cup cha championships. And you can see now that, in fact, he's actually gone to the front, Dominguez, and he's putting the pressure onto Bartoli. And Robbie Hunter gasping for breath, hoping he can just hold on for a little bit further. But they've certainly opened up a pretty impressive gap. There's the scrabble we expected to see here on the Cipressa just to see whose legs have come down from Milan the best. They've picked up Hunter. Hunter looks as though he might have difficulty hanging on there now as Juan Carlos Dominguez and Michele Bartoli continue to apply the pressure as the field now tries to break up from behind. Looks like Amika Chips rider here trying to get clear of the field and uh, this is going to happen all of the time now as riders feel they can do it but once they get out front they find the lactic acid starts to kick in and before you know it the pack are back around your wheels and the descent here off the Cipressa is also a very risky Robbie Hunter's been dropped there we can see that the, the Lamprey rider is no longer in the front of this bike race Dominguez is really digging deep there and I think he's putting Michele Bartoli into a little bit of uh, difficulty as well Robbie Hunter now left behind the last remnant of that breakaway of four riders who'd been at the head of the fair all the way along the coast 
and we came to these very serious final few climbs here but you can see normally when you ride the Chipressa Phil what happens is there's a very big tempo at the front of the bike race and what happens is we get a group of 15 or 20 bike riders go off the front this looks like David Echabaria the Onsei yes. rider so that's good to see him riding very much at the front his team leader Laurent Jalabert and also um, Alabraham Olano are not present at the moment but there's still a very big group behind here on those furly slopes of the Chipressa well, the, the Amica Chips rider looks like the tall figure of Ivan Basso, but either way, it's not going to matter very soon because the others are coming up, and they're going to pick up Robbie Hunter before the top of the Chipressa as well. Looks like the effort has really bit in that, those pair of legs. These two, though, and you're right, Paul, the strong man here is Dominguez, coming off a great season last year and starting it in flying colours this year. He must have a little bit better form than Bartoli right now. Absolutely, Bartoli's trying to improve, trying to get better after a long layoff. And Dominguez in fine form after a very good early season campaign. And he's a very strong rider on these slopes. And I would think Michele Bartoli's going to be pretty happy to have somebody along with him for the ride. Because after the top of Chipressa here, there's a very dangerous descent down onto the coastal road again. A descent which in fact put paid to the career of Jan Raas a few years ago. Raas was taking major risks on the descent of uh, Chipressa down here. And he actually went over one of the barriers. And he had to end up being in a kind of a corset to support his back for the next two to three months and, and after that he was never the same bike rider again. No, well accidents do happen of course, we just hope that they are never serious. This is a nice chance to see the colours of the new Fasa Bortolo team being worn by Luca Maseranti, the Italian. Anybody will have a go in Milan San Remo, you don't have to be a superstar by reputation because you never know, although the, it is very unusual for anybody but one of the big names to win this race. There's a new team on the block this year, Faso Bortolo. In fact, the team manager, Giancarlo Ferretti, coming back into the sport. He's the man who used to run the Ariostia squad and then the MG squad as well. A very tough team manager. And a lot of right bike riders do say they would like to do one or two seasons with him because he certainly knows how to make the most out of a bike rider. But certainly when it comes to discipline, he has to be the hardest team manager on the circuit. Now the pursuit and the pursuers here as Bartoli is now seemingly clinging to the wheel of Dominguez, the Vitalicio rider from Spain. Hunter's back in the pack, it looks like the big figure potentially of Zbigniew Spruk has come to the front for Mape, for Lampre rather. Still an awful lot of riders in that group. This is the thing about Milan San Remo, the tempo is very fast, the gearing is high, but the pack basically holds itself together down this coast because it's so early on in the season everybody's roughly about the same level of fitness but we're now coming into the town of Chipressa at the top we're almost finished with the climbing and very shortly we'll be onto that descent that I was telling you about the top of the climb is just there by the church they go across the town square and then it's a left-hand turn to begin the descent and then it zigzags all the way back down to the coast that then leaves the riders about 10 12 kilometers of flat then along the coastal road before they then attack the final climb of the day the Poggio and you can see it still fill a very big gap and which is, I find, a little bit strange because normally the pressure on the front of the main field here on the Chipressa is likely to split the field into a group of 15 or 20 riders and that certainly hasn't happened today. No, it hasn't. The Chipressa is six kilometres long and as we come towards the top of it, it's approximately 300 feet higher than the upcoming Poggio, uh, but not quite as steep as the Poggio. Average gradient of 4% as we now begin the twisty descent. Ooh, a little bit of a rock and roll there. I would think advantage swings back to Bartoli on the way down. Absolutely, that was the corner there, in fact, where Jan Raas went over that protected barrier at the side of the road. Now the attacks are coming from Rabobank, and these Rabobank riders certainly have been excellent when it comes to the, the one-day classics. They've got a very good uh, team manager, a strategician uh, in Teo de Roy. He knows exactly how to go out to the front on these attacks. That looked as if it might have been Rolf Sorensen trying to go up the front there. Sorensen, another man trying to find a little bit of form early on this season. Another great bike rider reaching the end of a wonderful career, Rolf Sorensen. And back with the two leaders now, you see the difference here. The Spanish riders are never the best descenders without a virtually an exception. But here you see Micheli Bartoli take the dive down, back down to the side of the Adriatic Sea. Bartoli leaving Dominguez behind. I'm not sure that's such a sensible move here, Phil, because there's still a very long ride along the flat coastal plain in between these two climbs, and Bartoli is going to need somebody to help him, but he's not waiting at all. He's opened up a pretty impressive gap there of about 50 meters on Dominguez, and Dominguez is getting down. Look at the speed there on the clock, 60 kilometers, more than 60 kilometers an hour, which in fact is uh, around about 45 miles an hour. 
Yes, the, well, the, the speed you would expect now as they come down what is a narrow road, but the advantage always with the, th the small group at the front here. As again, a number of teams still showing an interest in pulling this race back together again. Dominguez, a little bit out of control here now, not really enjoying his descent because Michele Bartoli is beginning to run away with this and he might well get to the Poggio by himself. Well, Bartoli's hammering around these corners. We're actually on the fastest part of the descent here, Phil. It's not quite too technical anymore and you can see, in fact, that Bartoli is hardly touching his brakes at all. He's leaning into those corners and Dominguez is actually not descending too badly, but you can see Michele Bartoli certainly knows these corners an awful lot better than the man behind him he's probably been here several times during the winter months and actually practiced this descent because Milan San Remo on so many occasions has actually been one on the descent of the climbs now there's an organization coming to the front this is Gian Matteo Fanini a big transfer this winter season in fact from the Seiko Cannondale squad of Mario Cipollini he's been brought into telecom to look after Eric Zabel and I think Cipollini was very saddened by the movement across this winter of that rider Yes, I would think so, um, but you can't blame uh, Fanini for that. He's got a good man to lead out now in Eric Zabel, if they can catch up. It looks as though Dominguez is doing just that. Uh, Bartoli has had two fifth places over the years in Milan San Remo. Nothing better than that, my goodness me. How many people would love uh, just to say they finished fifth in this event? Uh, but the win is more in the mind of this great Italian rider, the former world number one who has been knocked out of competition by that serious crash last year in the Tour of Germany, which also put out one or two other big riders, including Jan Ulrich, uh, sidelined for a while as well. well. They look like the figure of Francesco Casagrande in the blue jersey of Vinnie Candlerillo right at the front of the main field as well. He's also the kind of bike rider who on that final ascent of the Poggio has got the punch to open up a gap sufficient enough to hold on down to the finish line. Now Michele Bartoli is a really small rider, very low down on his machine. You can see him now, the face on him as he, a little word there across to Dominguez yeah. saying, right, we're on the flat part of the course now. We've got to keep this tempo high. We've got to give ourselves around about 30 seconds by the time we get to the bottom of the Poggio. And only then have we got a chance of holding on to the finish. But this road here, Phil, is so long and so straight that if there is a big team left behind, they've got the advantage of being able to organize themselves at the front. And I'm not sure if there are enough, in fact, they'd see as if the split has happened there is a group of 25 or 30 riders and in fact they're telling us on the race radio that there has been a crash at the back of the course well we'll see if we can find out more about that but you know i'm full of admiration for the spanish rider here we don't often see a spanish rider on the attack in milan san remo near the end like this and he's joined a great man in bartoli and he might well make something of this but here comes the reaction thick and fast now we're bridging, remember, towards the Poggio, and that's when the next move is likely to come. As you can see here, this is very much the figure of Rolf Sorensen trying to go out of the front here, trying to use the motorbikes as much as possible, trying to get himself across to Michele Bartoli, but it's very, very difficult. The pace is certainly on at the front, and Michele Bartoli and Dominguez are working very well together. I think Dominguez, for the moment, certainly has got the match of Michele Bartoli. Bartoli using reasonably small gears. You can see the cadence there pretty high at the moment as he gets onto the wheel of Dominguez, the man in front of him. And it, I wonder if that bandage really is doing anything or if it's just a precautionary measure for the first few bike races of the season. Well, I hope and uh, would think it's a precaution, but obviously he's been talking of twinges in that leg and a loss of power in that leg. And that one would expect that as he's now building it back up to match the other leg uh, ready for the big season. Sorensen still chasing. Well, the last time he was placed in Milan San Remo, Paul, was 10 years ago, 1991. He was second. That is an awful long time. Oh. He's another one of those riders who's been pro for an awful long time, you know, and he's always been a man very good at the one-day bike races. And maybe, like uh, Henny Kuiper, he will get better and better as the years go by. What a wonderful career this man has had. He's won 56 bike races in a career which started in 1986. And, and many of those uh, wins have been big classic events. And I think one of the most dramatic must have been when he was wearing the yellow jersey at the Tour de France film. Yeah. He was involved in that yeah. crash, broke a collarbone and actually finished the stage in the same time as the rest of the field. But unfortunately with his broken collarbone wasn't able to carry on the next day. He's a tough well, man. He wanted to. He wanted to actually carry on. And he asked the doctors if there was any way they could sort of strap it up so he could ride. Unbelievable.
Well, Mape moving up into a defensive position here. That looks like Paolo Bettini in second position there on the tail of this rider from Faso Bortolo. I can't get in there just to ID who he is at the moment, but certainly he's looking like a very powerful bike rider. In fact, it looks to me as if it might be Andrea Ferrigato, and he's one of the old campaigners, a man who a few years ago, in fact, was a winner of the Leeds Classic in the United Kingdom when it was a World Cup race and there you can see that field certainly has been reduced field by an awful lot since the Cipressa down to around about 40 riders now. Well this is the face of Juan Carlos Dominguez still willing to work as fast as possible here the big chain wheels are being worked to death today as they race towards the Poggio now this little man here is such a slight builder he always looks as though he's not quite in balance and yet he has so much speed in those legs a wonderful single day rider Bartoli one of the discoveries really of uh, Giancarlo Ferretti the man we were talking about before who's the team manager of Fasa Bortolo Ferretti always believed that Bartoli was a man capable of going forward to being a serious contender for the uh, Tour de France he felt that he was a good stage race rider but for the moment his major performances have really always been in the one day classics and that field has been sliced in a quarter of what it was earlier as the telecom are now getting to the front and there is Cipollini as well. Well that's impressive to see Cipollini at the front in this race because Cippo is always having a hard time on the Cipressa. Today he's managed to succeed, he's only got one climb left to go and this may well be the year that Mario Cipollini gets the race that he's always dreamed of Phil because Milan San Remo is a race that every sprinter would like to win. It's a race mm. where really all you've got to do is try and survive over the two big climbs and if Cipo's got over the Cipressa that means he's in pretty impressive form so he's got a great crack at finish when finishing in the first uh, two or three when we get down to the final foot sprint on the Via Roma. Sight there of Oscar Fer as well remember he's been to have a look at the course now he's the world champion, he wants to put his name on the trophy of Milan San Remo and that would be a rare victory for a Spanish boy. George Incapi is still in this leading group so that's a good ride by George. I noticed there that he was still managed to pulling himself to the front there. He had a teammate with him as well so that's pretty impressive. These two leaders though Phil they are still working very well together. Michele Bartley urgently trying to go to the front to keep the pace high but they now must realize because they're in radio communication with their team managers behind that the big organization is coming from Telecom and Telecom for, for a change in Milan San Remo have an awful lot of bike riders in this group. There are four riders riders in this group and on recent occasions when we've seen Eric Zabel come to the finale in fact he's been very much isolated and today he's got on the front there Vinukurov a man who we'll see a lot more of later in the year trying to help Jan Ulrich at the Tour de France but he's also got in there Stefan Weissemann, Kai Hundemark and there you can see he's sitting very close to the front in fourth position Eric Zabel the winner of two of these Milan San Remos in the last three years. Oh and the boys in pink here trying to haul in the two out front uh, no Spaniard has won this event since 1959. That was Miguel Poble, who won it then in 59. They're very rarely in at the result. It's not their sort of race, and that is apparent. But now they've been very prominent today, and they've got the world champion hovering near the front in the event that the Dominguez might get picked up. Well, there's two riders from U.S. Postal Service in that main field there, Phil. In fact, Yatislav Ekimov is in there as well. Ekimov switching across during the winter season again, one of the big transfers back to the U.S. Postal Service. And from what we believe, it's at the express request of Lance Armstrong. He's always appreciated Ekimov as a top bike rider and a man capable of working and also of winning bike races. Kai Hundemark on the front there's Eric Zabel and Cipollini Phil knows just exactly which wheel he wants as we come up towards the Poggio he wants the wheel of Eric Zabel because as a, a as a, a sprinter and not necessarily a good climber he's going to base his climb of the Poggio on that of Eric Zabel and very much to the front as well was Andre Schmiel so last year's winner still in with a chance they're still on the coastal road here there's 10 kilometers still left to go to the finish and in about three kilometers time they'll come to that right hand turn the bottom of the Poggio where Eddie Murphy laid the foundations for seven of his victories here in this great yeah. bike race and his is the record of course seven great victories for the wonderful Eddie Merckx these two riders though are slowly being hauled in there they are and there they are and there's no more to my money than 30 riders left in this hunt now 
There's Spruck at the front there and Francesco Casagrande. Yeah. All the big names for the moment at the front of this bike race. Well, I reckon the bike race is over for Michele Bartoli because they only have around about 10 seconds advantage over the main field. And in a bike race like Milan San Remo at the start of the season, you only get one shot at it. And today's shot has been from Michele yeah. Bartoli on the Cipressa. The, the click of the arm there asking Dominguez to come to the front is really just prolonging the agony because this is the bottom of the podium at the moment. They still have five seconds, but wait till you see the attacks coming from this group, Phil, as they take the right-hand turn. Roman's veins then, and that's a problem. That's George Hincapie, and I think he's gone with a puncture as the start of the Poggio. Now, what kind of luck is that? Well, I can't believe it. That is the worst place you could ever have to puncture in this whole of the bike race. He's oh. just done 290 kilometers, and there it is. It's a flat tire, and that's the end of Milan San Remo for Georgi, and he was looking so good. He was looking superb. Even there, he looks completely cool, but that's it. There's no way now George can get back here. That is absolutely disastrous for poor old Georgie. And he leaves just Ekimov up there now with nobody to lead out for the sprint. And as we go back onto the climb of the Poggio, now if these two can survive, even with 15 seconds to the top, it is possible they could survive to the bottom and win the day. Absolutely. If you've got 20 seconds over the top of the Poggio, you've got a great chance of surviving because it is an unbelievably dangerous descent off the top of this mountain. But you'll see the big accelerations coming from behind, Phil. And one man who was riding in third position in that group was Roman Weinsteins. Already this year, a winner of a stage of Tirreno Adriatico, he, he wore the leader's jersey at that bike race. And he certainly is the kind of man you wouldn't want to take to the finish. There he is there, 232 in the jersey, which indicates he's the champion of Latvia. Looks like Andre Schmil is racing him as well because he's riding on his wheel here. Maybe a man to lead out back to the front now. These two are in desperate straits as they try to scurry clear of the field. Dominguez is the stronger rider here. You can see Bartoli is consistently getting out of his saddle, accelerating, trying to stay on the wheel of the very powerful Spanish rider on the front there from the Vitalico team. He's out of the saddle as well, but he looks a lot more comfortable. He looks as if he's still got plenty of power. They've still got a good advantage. Yep. It's still around about five to ten seconds, but in fact, the attack hasn't come. I would have expected the attacks to come from this group, Phil, but at the moment, they're riding a very steady tempo. Vini Calderola setting the pace there for perhaps uh, for Francesco Grande. That bunch can't be more than 25 strong. We don't know the word about a poor George Hincapie. He's got to be chasing now, but he's going to waste a lot of energy if he tails onto the back of the convoy there. Well, George, you won't have much morale puncturing there. That is the worst point of the whole bike race, especially when you're in with a chance of victory. He may well just ride over the top of the Poggio to get himself some points here and hope that he can stay inside of the top 30. Now, that was a very bad corner. We're not far from the summit now of the Poggio. You see, Domingos doesn't know this climb quite as well as mm. Michele Bartoli. Bartoli was very fluid down the descent. Look at that, Phil. They're right there now. They've flown around those hairpins and they're going to snap them up at the most crucial stage of Milan San Remo as they come up towards the summit. Now, watch out for Vane Stains in second place. Smil, the winner from last year, is there and it looks as though it's Arrivederci to Mario Cipollini. He has hung in for 290 kilometers, but the legs just left him. He won't be happy with that, Phil. Certainly, he was hoping today. He was dreaming. He got over the Cipressa, which is a much harder climb, and managed to stay in the leading group. But he ha cannot stay on the back wheel of that big flying peloton right now. There's Michele Bartoli. They've been caught. There's Weinstein. Shamil has come up there. In this group as well is Peter Van Pietigem. He'll be wearing a grey jersey from the Farm Freed squad. So now it's getting urgent. There he is on the far side moving forward. This is the moment when they were caught. Michele Bartoli and Juan Carlo Dominguez have been pulled back into the fold by the flying peloton. Ah, oh, what a shame. It was a great attack indeed by those riders. Good to see that Michele is only on the, is definitely on the way back and on the edge of good form now, as it looks like Andreas Clear, the farm freaks boy from Germany, who's sitting up at the front now. Second position was David Rebelin from the Liquid Gas team. He's the leader of that squad. Now that is a very good performance. Now Clear is a very good bike rider. He'll be trying to keep the pace high, certainly thinking about the performance of Peter Van Pietigem. Van Pietigem, very good sprinter when it comes down to the end of long races. Weinsteins, once again a little isolated, looking over his shoulder to see who's there and he's got the winner from last year right on his wheel that is Andre Schmiel fifth position there is Francesco Casagrande it really is a roll honor of the names of the top of international cycling Phil nearly everybody is there at the moment
Well, everybody will begin to feel they've got a chance here now as the domestics start to look out for the rest of their team. Uh, but Veinstein is holding always the first three or four places. He's moved up to second now. Just keeping an eye on everybody making the moves, occasionally gesticulating. He is feeling very confident. Well, that was an attack there by Rebelline, just trying to accelerate a little bit. Everybody wants to be the first man to go around the corner at the top here and begin the descent. Rebelline digging deep. This is when you can get the big gear in now. They're on the large chain ring around about the 16 or 17 sprocket. He's got a slight advantage, but they're not going to let him get too far off the front. Moving up into second position there is Peter van Pietigem, and very shortly they'll take the left-hand turn at the bottom, at the top of this climb. Schmiel still attentive. He's in third place. What a, what a remarkable performance that would be at almost 37 years of age, Phil, if he could make it two wins in a row. That would be superb, wouldn't it be? Just, and um, he's a naturalised Belgium now, Rebelin. His best performance in Milan San Remo is fourth back in 1995 when he was being talked about as a great star. Well, he wins a lot of bike races. He's not quite in the category yet of the big names of the sport, but he's a regular at the visitors at the finishing podium. Now another attack. Well, they've got the gap. This is a very good move. Trying to pull them back there was Francesco Casagrande at the front of the main field. And it looks very much as if Laurent Jalabert from Once may well be in that group of riders too. Now they're leaving all of the work here to David de Rebelin. Very shortly, they will be coming to the left-hand turn at the top. And then it's the plunge down to the finish. Well, I reckon if you're in good form and you've got 10 or 15 seconds, you can stay clear to the finish, but they're not going to get that at the moment, yeah. Phil. You see the group is splitting again, splintering off the front, and it's all under the pressure again from the Once squad. 10 or 15 lengths is about all they're going to get here, but it just shows you Andre Schmil paying absolute attention. We're off the Poggio now, we're on the dive down to the finish in San Remo. And that group is a very elite group all of a sudden because of the high speed racing over 30 kilometers. Chasing the Skibby group first, the Bartoli group second. There's only been three breakaways since this race started and it's still going to come down to the sprinters. What a blow for Mario Cipollini. He was having a superb day. He managed to get his body over the Cipressa, something that's not been possible for him over the last few years. And then there he was, ready for the Poggio and boom, just one kilometre from the summit he's been blown away. This is Van Pietigem, it's not Van Pietigem, it's Paolo Bettini who's going to take advantage on the descent here and try and get himself into a move and try and split off the front. This field descent off the Poggio is very dangerous indeed. If you take a few risks you can open up the advantage. I think the best descent I've ever seen of the Poggio was done by Sean Kelly a few oh. years ago when Argentin <laughs> thought he had it in the bag and boom, Kelly came from nowhere but now Bettini's trying to do the same. Paolo Bettini, sitting low in the saddle, a rider who doesn't win a lot either, but everybody wishes he would. He's a very good bike rider. Got a little bit of a lead here now. We've seen so many men in this position over the years at Milan San Remo, including Rolf Sorensen, who went a bit earlier. But they're always swept up as the race regroups at the bottom. Well, it's Andre Schmiel taking up the chase in first position there. He's followed by David Rebelin. And Schmiel may well not take up the chase because he knows there's one or two teams here left with multiple riders and he won't be the one to do all of the work on the front. And you can see Bettini now is opening up his advantage. He's got three or four seconds now and he's got few, a few more very dangerous corners to go but from the bottom of the Poggio it's still a very long three kilometer ride to the finish line on the Via Roma which I reckon is one of the most beautiful race finishes you can have for any of the big bike racing classics. Well Bettini as he brings them down the twist and turns back into San Remo this rider now playing the second card of map eight it was the first one played by Bartoli and now he's trying to uh, draw the sting of the sprinters because they know they are taking this race down to the likes of Schmil and Zabel and any other good sprinter who's left in this group. Looks like Casagrande coming to the front is the blue jersey of Vinnie Calderilla. But you can see Bettini wasn't as fluid as his team leader there, Michele Bartoli, in these corners. He's certainly not picking the fastest route around and he's losing an awful lot of momentum. He's picking it up now as he's plunging down inside four kilometers to go. He's got around about five or six hundred meters of descent left to go. There's Casagrande. That looks like Jalabert moving up now. He's got a teammate upside him, up alongside him as well. So Jalabert is a good man for the sprint at the end of 294 kilometers. But one thing they have to do first is pull Bettini back into the fold. Jalabert, one of the greatest of all the current bike riders of stock because he is so consistent from March through to October, Lon Jalabert is in the action and you can't say that for very many bike riders now as modern cycling causes people to end the season early or take time out in the middle. Bettini now is scrambling for the finish and living purely on hope. 
he hammered around that corner there. He nearly went into the coffee shop for a quick cappuccino. Managed to keep it upright, keep it on the main road there. But he, looking over his shoulder, he can see that the main group is still only five or six seconds behind. We're leveling off now. We're almost down into the town of San Remo. And very shortly, he will shoot out onto the main road, which will leave him that three kilometers to go down to the finish line on the Via Roma. Casagrande now moving up to take up the pacemaking. All of the time, Andre Schmiel in the white jersey is riding very close to the front and he really surprised everybody last year with that big explosion in the final kilometers. Rebellin now picking it up for liquid gas. He's trying to go forward. He's a man who certainly knows how to attack in the final kilometers. They're off the Poggio now, <laughs> Phil. You can see, come on, help. We've got a chase. We've got somebody in the front. Schmiel now deciding to move forward. 178 is Abraham Alano. So that is really remarkable to see Alano and Jalabert up there. Alano certainly must pull it all back and try and get something out going for Jalabert. And the Lamprey guy who's joining in is Jibinev Spruk as well now. So they're all trying to bring him back. They can see him. This is a fabulous piece of riding by Bettini. This little man who's just hoping there now that he can hold them off. He better not look over his shoulder because they're right behind him. And this is a long straight. There they come. They're massing for the charge and the sprinters are licking their lips. Well, unfortunately for him, if this had been Milan San Remo of a few years ago, he already would have won, but they've, re they've removed it from the finishing straight here and put it back to where it always finished in the time of Eddie Merckx, right on the Via Roma. They're right on his tail now. The acceleration from Onse coming from David Echabaria on the front there, the little man who won two stages of the Tour de France mm. last year. He He's trying to keep the pressure high. He's hoping that his man, Laurent Jalabert, can finish it off. But for Bettini, he knows it's over. He's got nothing left in those legs. And we've got one big bunch. There is Oscar Frere right at the front. Well, this could be a very interesting final uh, distance to the line now. We're looking for the kilometre kite. They've come back together. Maybe 35 riders here. And there's the kilometre now. It has become a sprinter's delight. It certainly has. There's a rider moving clear there. Vitalio Seguros going off the front. Another good late attack, but there are so many guys queuing up now. There are multiple riders from several teams. There are a lot of pink jerseys from Team Telecom trying to get organized. They come around this corner, and then they only have around about 800 meters to go, and it is a very long sprint finish, Phil. And this looks like the move that may well have caught them. This is like the move of last year, Andre Schmiel. It's a Vitalio Seguros rider. He is just hoping he can survive. Once he gets to the end of all these big apartments, it's 500 meters to the finish. Well, this could be a surprise win, but one has the feeling it won't be. Sergei Ivanov looks over his shoulder to see where the boys are. It looks like uh, Jean uh, Matteo Fanini has got himself his sprinter on his wheel there in Eric Zabo. And Andre Schmil has been boxed out of this now. And this is looking as though Fabio Baldato trying to break in on the sprint. Konishev leading him out on the left of our picture. The two big sprinters. They've timed this to perfection because Zabo goes now. And Eric Zabo has got the head of the race and they're not going to get him on the line. That was Baldato in second place. I think it was. I think Oscar Freire has got third. And that was a superb debut by the world champion. But they pull back this Vitalicio, Vitalicio rider right on the line. Zabal Paul had this all the way. Certainly does. Look at the overdrive. As soon as he's got the gap there, nobody's coming up alongside him at all. It's great to see Fabio Baldato there throwing his bike up for second place. Baldato really was in the right position there. You can see he's right on the wheel of Eric Zabal. But you give Eric Zabal a lead out like Gian Matteo Fanini gave him, and he gets, launches himself into orbit, and nobody's going to come by him. A great performance by him. Three wins in four years at this, the classic of sprinters. And I've now finally nailed down that Vitalithio rider. It was Ido Aggiano who almost pulled off the big surprise of Milan San Remo. But at the end of the day, it is three wins out of four tries for Eric Zabel. He's one of only a handful of riders with three victories now. He's also the leader of the World Cup. So a superb race, I hope you'll agree with us, in the end Milan San Remo came alive, the race down to the sun, that's the way it has been this year, if the classics continue like this then we're all looking forward to the rest of the season. So for my beautiful San Remo, bathed in sunshine for Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye to you all and see you again very shortly.